All right, y'all. Day four of the Sam Bankman Freed trial and day four of OPJ courtroom edition. I have been in court all day long, though we did get out earlier today, and I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about day four here at the SBF trial. It was all about Gary Wang today. Oh my God, I keep getting his name wrong. They said his name wrong in court. They said Gary Wang. So Gary Wang. And today was all about Gary Wang. For those of you who don't know, Gary Wang was the co-founder of both Alameda Research and FTX with Sam Bankman Freed. So he's a pretty powerful witness just in terms of his seniority and how much he was around for everything that happened. His testimony began yesterday. The prosecution continued questioning him today. And then we started to get to the cross-examination of him, and that's where we stopped. I will say high-level thoughts. I thought the defense, I thought they were much better today. I, I think people have mixed opinions on it probably, but I thought the, the defense put up a much stronger showing today. I'll talk a little bit more about that during the cross-examination piece that I'll talk about. Um, in general, I felt they were stronger. They seemed more organized. I felt they were making more specific counterpoints that I could understand and follow. And they weren't just asking repetitive questions, which is all they really did yesterday. The prosecution, however, also continued to be strong, or I should say the prosecution continued to be strong in contrast to the defense. And, and Gary was strong. I mean, he is nerdy and clearly a little awkward, but in some ways I think that makes him seem even more credible because there's something believable about nerds. Like you just feel like, well, this guy can't be lying, which of course is how we got into this mess because SPF was like that and he was constantly lying. So let's get into some of that. Some of the some of the SBF lies that got us in this situation. So today we got an interesting timeline essentially laid out for us over the course of many hours of testimony. So I'm going to start us in July 31st, 2019, because it was on July 31st, 2019, that Gary says he and Nashad were directed by Sam to add a feature as part of the code base of FTX that would allow Alameda Research to essentially deposit unlimited, I'm sorry, to essentially withdraw unlimited amounts of funds from FTX. So usually if you're a customer of FTX, if I deposit $100 onto the FTX website, I can't take out $300 from the website from FTX, but Alameda could. Now, of course, on the surface, this feels very shady. And in many ways, it was very shady. I'm going to talk a little bit about the other reasons that they were allowed to do this because it came up during the cross-examination. But for now, let's just start with this. July 31st, 2019. So very early on in FTX's story, they implement this code base that allows Alameda to withdraw as much money as they want to. They can have a negative balance, essentially. They can have a very significant negative balance with FTX and basically owe FTX a lot of money if they wanted to. That same day, on July 31st, 2019, Sam tweets... Quote, Alameda is a liquidity provider on FTX, but their account is just like everyone else's. Alameda's incentive is just for FTX to do as well as possible. By far, the dominant factor is helping make the trading experience as good as possible. So let's spot the lie in this sentence. The definite lie is Alameda is a liquidity provider on FTX, but their account is just like everyone else's. <clears throat> Alameda's account was definitely not just like everyone else's. And there were a bunch of, we heard this a bunch of times, we heard this yesterday about these special privileges that Alameda had. There were many, there were four, I think, main categories of special privileges that Alameda had. But this first one is so important, this ability to withdraw as much money as they possibly want is important because that was implemented in the code the same day that Sam tweeted this. Now, I actually want to talk about the other side a little bit here because obviously on the surface that looks bad. And I think at the end of the day, it is bad because Sam is clearly lying in this tweet. But the other parts around this also give us some context here. So Sam in this tweet, as I read, also says, Alameda's incentive is just for FTX to do as well as possible. By far, the dominant factor is helping make the trading experience as good as possible. What Sam has said to people like Tiffany Fong, who I talk to a bunch and we do some Twitter spaces together. And what he said, I think probably in the press to some degree, is Alameda was, especially when FTX started, was the largest market maker and liquidity provider on FTX. So 
Alameda was incredibly important for the trading experience on FTX, certainly in the beginning, but it remained an important part of the trading experience on FTX, even down the line, because it market made, right? It made sure there was enough liquidity. If you wanted to buy or sell something, you needed somebody big like Alameda there to take the other sides of trades if there weren't enough individuals taking the other side of that trade. So for that reason, and there was something specific about stable coins that frankly was a little bit above my pay grade, like the, the defense was trying to argue that this decision and that frankly all of the special privileges Alameda was given were as were to help facilitate its role as a market maker. And I absolutely believe there is some truth to that for sure. This wasn't all just coming from a nefarious place. And so I th I really believe in Sam's mind certainly that's how he was justifying all of this. So when he sends out a tweet like that, there's truth in this tweet and you can see the seeds of the justification that he's providing. It doesn't take away from the fact that he's lying here and saying that their account is just like everyone else's when it's not. Okay, that's July 31st, 2019. That's when we first start to get these special privileges. It gets coded into, into the FTX code base. Now let's jump ahead to February 14th, 2021. So this is like almost two years later. This is the next interesting bit that I thought really came out of uh, Gary's testimony today. The FTX official account tweets something out saying that the FTX insurance pool, I might not be getting that, that terminology exactly right, but that's essentially what it is, that the FTX insurance pool had reached $100 million. Okay, why does this matter? What are we talking about here? Apparently, one of the big selling points that FTX used to promote itself, both to investors, we heard this a little bit yesterday with the paradigm testimony, and I think to the public, was that they had a unique way of handling risk and liquidity. And so when FTX started, apparently a lot of crypto exchanges had something called clawbacks, which basically meant that sometimes the profits, traders who made a profit and the profits from traders who were successful on the exchanges, those profits were used to help cover the losses of traders who did poorly on the exchange. Now, I know that sounds illegal or strange or like, what? And I feel that way too. Uh, I guess this isn't illegal. I don't know. Apparently this was like a standard practice and for some reason exchanges were able to get away with it and it wasn't, um, they were able to always pay the customers back. Like, who knows? We kind of glossed over that in the, in the court. But the reason this matters is because SBF said frequently, apparently, that FTX didn't do clawbacks. And that was like a selling point. It's like, we'll never operate that way. The implication sort of being, we're never going to take your profits. We're never going to play with your money as a customer. We're safer. Like, we have a better way to risk manage. And that better way to risk manage were these insurance pools. I think they said backstop liquidity providers was another term they used for this. So when they tweet out, there's $100 million in this insurance pool, they're saying there's basically $100 million there to cover losses so that everybody stays safe. Customers of the platform stay safe. FTX stays safe. This was a lie. There was not apparently $100 million in that insurance pool. We didn't get the number. We didn't get like how much was in there, but Gary testified that it was certainly less than $100 million. What felt even more damaging was that $100 million was also on their website. It, the, the website displayed how much was in the insurance pool, and that number was generated from code that just made up numbers. There was basically code on the back end that did some like bullshit calculation, which made sure that the number was sort of fluctuating and changing, which made it look more legit, but it was completely just f fraudulent. It was like a made up thing. I will say a lot of time in court today was spent looking at Python code, and that's it's interesting. It's how you build a case, right? Th that was really the smoking gun. Gary could tell us all these things were happening at FTX and say that, you know, there were these special privileges, et cetera, et cetera. But that's hearsay. But now that you see the code, it feels a lot less like hearsay. You're like, we're looking at the proof that this special privilege existed. And so that definitely was like, it was definitely a smoking gun that Alameda had special privileges. It's hearsay that Sam knew about it because Sam didn't actually commit the code but we're getting Gary's testimony that yes, Sam absolutely knew about all of this and not even knew about it. He was the one directing all of this to happen. Okay, so that tweet about the insurance, the $100 million insurance that was a total lie, that goes out in, on February 14th, Valentine's Day of 2021. Let's skip ahead now. Next moment in the timeline that I think matters here is June 2022. But before that, I do need to give a huge shout out to our amazing sponsors, Ledger, OpenSea, Web3Sense. I am so grateful 
to all three of these companies for supporting Overpriced JPEGs content. It's a tough time in the crypto NFT market out there and just so grateful for companies that support me as a creator. Thank you to each of you. And we've heard about June 2022 for the last three days in court or two days or however many days because this was relevant to Adam Udidia's testimony as well because Adam had testified that in June of 2022, there had been a meeting between Caroline, Sam, and Nishad, Caroline, Sam, Nishad, and Gary, the four main people, whoever, you guys know who they are, um, that they had met to do a full accounting of both the finances of Alameda and the finances of FTX. And then he said that after that meeting, this is Adam, Adam said that after that meeting, Adam was told to go and fix the bug that existed in the FTX code base that messed up the numbers. And I, I talked about that yesterday, I believe. I, I've certainly talked about it on some Twitter spaces, so I'm not going to rehash all of that now. But that's the last time we heard about June 2022. So today, as part of Gary's testimony, we heard more about that meeting between the four executives to do the full accounting of Alameda and FTX. And what it turns out came out of that was once the accounting was done, once the bug was fixed, the four of them determined that Alameda owed about $11 billion, that's billion with a B, to FTX. Gary testified, and this was important, that as part of one of these meetings, talking about this full accounting, Sam said, and I don't know if he testified, Gary testified that he said this to Caroline specifically or just said it generally with Caroline in the room, but Sam said, Alameda can go ahead and return the borrows. What does this mean? This means that Sam was telling Caroline that she could return money to lenders who were asking for their money back. So to give a little context here, the way Alameda worked as a trading firm is they borrowed money from other companies and then traded with that money. That was a big part of their, their whole business model. And if you guys remember in June of 2022, what was happening in the crypto markets, well, things were imploding. We had had the Terra Luna situation, which of course had created this contagion throughout the market. So you had three hours capital going down. I mean, there was a lot going on. And of course, Sam, meanwhile, is going out there like he's the king of freaking crypto trying to save everybody. Meanwhile, his company's got, you know, Alameda, who's like $11 billion in the hole, but that's a separate issue. And so Sam is saying, okay, you have all these lenders who have been hurting, like companies like Genesis who are out money because of the Terra Luna thing, coming to FTX saying, hey, we need our money back. We lent you money. We now need that back. And Sam was saying to Caroline, okay, go pay the lenders back. Now, Gary testified that this meant using customer funds because that $11 billion, like FTX had not made enough money. Alameda had not made enough money to cover that hole. So if lenders were going to be paid back, that must mean using customer funds. This is important because Tiffany has said that what Sam told her is that he never specifically said to use customer money, that he said something like, oh God, it would be really bad to default on our creditors, but that he never said it. And now Gary's saying, no, no, he explicitly said Alameda can go ahead and return the borrows. My feeling is I don't really care if he explicitly said it or he didn't explicitly say it. As far as I'm concerned, if Sam didn't explicitly tell Caroline not to return the money to lenders, he was telling her to do it. Like he was the owner of Alameda. He was the CEO of FTX. He was at one point the CEO of Alameda. He was running the, he was calling the shot. If he made any insinuation that it was bad to owe this money to lenders, he was basically giving Caroline the go ahead to repay the money and to use customer funds to do so. So like Sam is so clearly in the wrong here, no matter how you slice it or no matter how you hear his excuses that I don't even want to hear him. Um, an interesting fact is Genesis in particular. Gary said he believes Genesis specifically was mentioned in that meeting as being like a lender they should pay back. Genesis has a huge role to play in the crypto ecosystem, some may know. So um, I think Sam was very worried that if they didn't pay Genesis's loan back, Genesis could just implode and that would have terrible contagion throughout the industry. So that was one of his justifications as well. But okay, we're almost at the end here, moving ahead to the last, second to last moment in the timeline that I think matters, which is September of 2022. In September of 2022, Sam introduces the idea of closing Alameda. And he does this, he sends a Google document to Nishad and to Gary, notably not to Caroline, saying that he thinks they should sunset or he's, he's starting to think about shutting down Alameda. And he says this at the top of the document, and we reviewed this document in court. It says, I think it's time for Alameda to be shut down. Honestly, it was probably time to do that a year ago. And then he goes on to like enumerate the reasons he thinks that Alameda should be shut down. And the first one was he said that it was a PR hit, that Alameda was a PR hit to FTX. Now, one thing to know is that this document itself seemed to have been precipitated by rumors that there was a Bloomberg story that was going to come out 
scrutinizing the relationship between FTX and Alameda and how close it was. So Sam was clearly aware of this and was saying having Alameda at this point is like a PR risk to FTX and it's not worth it to us anymore. He also said something, he said in a couple of different ways that the Alameda leadership wasn't strong enough. He said like Alameda leadership is good, but not strong enough to something, something, something. It was hard to read in the, in the document on, uh, in court. Um, and he also said here, and this was interesting, he said a niche trading firm should be like Modulo. And then he said that Modulo had a stronger culture and leadership than Alameda. Now, Modulo is another trading firm. It was founded by two former Jane Street traders that Sam had known while he was at Jane, Jane Street. And most prominently, one of, one of the traders was a woman named Lily who founded Modulo. And Sam had dated Lily. So what he's saying here is maybe we should shut down Alameda, the trading firm run by one of my ex-girlfriends, because it should be more like Modulo, the trading for fund run like my other ex-girlfriend. And by the way, Sam had a 60% stake in Modulo. He had invested in Modulo. He, he owned the majority of Modulo as well. Anyway, this all came out in court, by the way, as well, I, that the fact, like, they mentioned that Lily was his ex-girlfriend. And, you know, it's, it's a little salacious up in here. So as part of this conversation about whether or not to sunset Alameda, Sam clearly in some way asks like Gary and Nishad to look into it and Gary and Nishad go and talk to Caroline to find out just exactly how big a role, how important the role of Alameda still was in FTX market making, et cetera. And as part of that, they, they've asked like how big the debt that Alameda owed FTX was. And at that point now in September of 2022, it was apparently $14 billion. So it had ballooned since that $11 billion figure. It was now $14 billion of in the hole. Now it starts to get really confusing. These numbers, like we were at 11 billion, a couple months later, we're at 14 billion. Were those perfectly comparable numbers? Like, are we measuring exactly the same things there? Is it a little bit different? I don't know. And frankly, I don't care. It feels higher level than it needs to be. For all intents and purposes, when they realized that the debt was $14 billion, they were like, hmm, that's way too large. We absolutely can't shut down Alameda because then we would have to shut down FTX because they don't have enough money to repay these debts. Okay. So they say, we're not going to shut down Al Alameda. Now this brings us to November of 2022 when everything actually implodes. It is at that point that we that the debt become is, is $8 billion, which again is interesting because now we're we're down from $14 billion to $8 billion. That was the whole left that was owed to customers. And everything starts to go downhill. They replayed the story that we all are very familiar with at this point from like November 6th, November 7th, November 8th. And I say we're familiar with it because m many of us like lived that story, which was Sam was tweeting things saying that everything was fine and dandy and that they had enough money to cover t customer withdrawals. And that was not true. They did not have enough money to, to cover customer withdrawals, et cetera, et cetera. What got interesting about the November 2022 testimony from Gary today is we he talked a bit about what happened after bankruptcy was declared. And there was one more kind of final sketchy thing that Sam did. So FTX declared bankruptcy on November 11th. And around that time, so obviously trading had been shut down on the FTX platforms. You know, nobody could withdraw their money. And I guess Bahamian regulators were asking FTX to send the remaining assets that FTX did have to the Bahamian regulators. Meanwhile, U.S. bankruptcy lawyers, who were the bankruptcy lawyers for FTX, were asking that for the assets to be sent to them. And Sam, who had met with Bahamian regulators, told Gary to send the assets to the Bahamas Security Commission because he felt that, bah that the Bahamian regulators were more favorable to Sam, that they liked him better, basically, and that they were they would keep Sam in charge of the company. They would let Sam stay CEO of FTX, whereas he felt like if this got into the hands of U.S. bankruptcy people, they wouldn't. And there's a we got to see today in court, we saw a signal chat between the four executives and the, the bankruptcy lawyers where they're talking about potentially sending the money to the Bahamian regulators because the Bahamian regulators, the Bahamas people, the officials were asking for it. And the bankruptcy lawyers were like, yeah, absolutely don't do that. Like they don't actually have jurisdiction here. And the FTX like Bermuda, uh, you know, Bahamas entity. This is where there's a lot of different entities that get confusing. Like they don't actually have jurisdiction. Like, yeah, don't, don't, don't do that. And Sam and Gary apparently had a conversation and Sam was like, eh, no, actually you should do that. And Gary listened to Sam and he did that. And then a few days later, they were both, you know, flew back to the United States. And on November 17th, Gary immediately starts meeting with the government for the U.S. and prosecutors. So that was it. I mean, there was so much more that we got into in court today, but I would say that's the high level summary of what we got into for the prosecution. That was like the general timeline. I thought there was 
it was really interesting to hear about each of these beats and to hear it from in Gary's own telling. And then I'll just say briefly, because I know this video is running a little long. Some of you are like, keep these short. And then some of you are like, no, we like all the details. Keep it long. So please do comment or tweet at me and tell me which your preference is. I would like to get a sense from people like, do you like a little bit more detail or would you like it to be very snappy? So I'll just say a few things on the cross defense. I've, I've already talked about this a, a bit. What the defense did effectively to me today was coming off of the prosecution's questioning of Gary Wang. <laughs> I keep forgetting if it's Wang or Wang. Uh, coming off of the, the prosecutor's questioning of Gary Wang, it really did feel like, oh my gosh, there was so much shady stuff going on. All these special privileges that Alameda had were so shady and so unacceptable, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I heard the, pros when I heard the defense's cross-examination, I was like, oh, wait, there was a reason for all of this beyond just being greedy and nefarious. There was a purpose to this, and that purpose was market-making. And, and there is something legitimate to all that. Alameda was an important piece of allowing the FTX market place and the exchange to function super well and to provide the best experience to customers. At the end of the day, it still doesn't, doesn't exonerate Sam or what they did at all. But it does help to explain like how these special, why these special privileges were first enabled. And then you can kind of see how things escalated over time. I mean, there was another whole piece of, of, of the trial today about the $65 billion line of credit and how they, how Alameda ended up getting a $65 billion line of credit and how it kept slowly getting raised. Initially, they had a million dollar line of credit, then it was a hundred million dollars, then it was a billion dollars, and then it ended up at $65 billion. Like there, but over and over again, the defense tried to show like, hey, these systems were put in place to help with the liquidity and the functioning of FTX. Again, it doesn't fucking exonerate anything because if you needed Alameda to be in this much debt in order for your product to function. It's not a functioning product. So it, it doesn't excuse everything by any means, but it was interesting. And I found it at least more effective than what they did yesterday, which was seemingly absolutely nothing. So that was it. That was day four in court. We still have to finish the cross-examination. So when court resumes on Tuesday, we got a little three-day break here. When court resumes on Tuesday, the defense will continue their cross-examination of Gary Wang. And then it's being speculated that Caroline Ellison may, in fact, be the next witness to go up after Gary. Not confirmed, but people are saying that, which is really the, the – that's really the testimony that everyone is – most excited about and most looking forward to. Thank you so much, as always, for watching this. Uh, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know what you think. And like I said in the past, as a reminder, Tiffany Fong and I are doing a Twitter space after court every day. So it's usually around like 4.30 or 5, because that's usually when court lets out. Um, we're going to try and schedule them in advance, I think, moving forward. But in any case, 4.30 or 5, and we take questions and, you know, comments and whatever as we talk about all this stuff. And so go check that out if you're interested or if you want to be more participatory in these. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening and following and commenting and whatever else. And I will see you all on Tuesday. Bye.